So welcome to the ITS seminar on jittering and routing options for converting origin destination data into route networks. It's quite a technical title, I guess, and it's uh, the presentation uh, that builds on uh, a paper that myself, Rosa, and Dustin Carlino, who's actually in the audience, wrote together. So this is the first time that uh, we are physically in the same place. So um, that's good. Uh, just very briefly in terms of the history of this, I can't remember exactly when it was when Rosa and I started collaborating, but she got in touch, I think, about um, modeling cycling. And then we, yeah, just um, started doing some work together and trying to use some of the tools that we built in Leeds in Lisbon. Uh, where she's based. So yeah, Rosa is um, based at the University of Lisbon. And is it, uh, what's your current, you've recently got a new job job role in Lisbon? Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, I can introduce myself. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah. My name is Rosa Felix. Um, I, my background is uh, civil engineering and urban planning. But then I uh, did a PhD in transportation uh, at University of Lisbon, uh, and now I, I work as a researcher at uh, U-Shift Lab, which is a, a, a lab in the civil engineering department um, that deals with uh, active travel, cycling, pedestrian, uh, mass mobility as, as a service, uh, micro mobility, you know, all these kind of other non-car, uh, well, at least as a driver um transportation um yeah and uh, we are a team of uh, about 10 phds uh, and uh, master students yeah uh, and we do uh some cool stuff <laughs> um yeah and uh, this collaboration with uh, with robin and the university of leeds it's inside of one project uh but we also did other like the slopes package and the, um, the jittering approach. Um, yeah. yeah, great. <laughs> yeah, so, and I think, I've just remembered, I think it was Aveiro in Portugal, yeah, where yeah, there was so the 2017. Scientist for Cycling collaboration, and it's one of those where you just have a very brief five-minute conversation at a conference, and then it's led to this big collaboration. One other thing is that we applied for a Portuguese UK bilateral scientific collaboration grant, which was about ten thousand euros or something for oh, travel. Less, less than that. Okay, yeah, yeah, but that that kind of enabled us to have some travel. So we have um, yeah got got this project going. And at the moment, we are working on a fairly big project uh, covering all of uh, the Lisbon municipality, which is two point eight million people and how to um yeah how do we get how do we really like create a, a revolution in the transport system there to get from 0.5 percent mode share of cycling to four percent by 2025 and ten percent by 2030 so these are huge targets and it's good that they've um, commissioned research to provide the evidence base for that. So that's the policy motivation of this um, talk. So I think the plan is I'm going to very briefly go through um, some of the methods, which is where the jittering comes in. And then um, Rose is going to talk about the application in Lisbon. So um, before I get started, and also just to test the technology, because this is a hybrid event, are there any questions from anyone about anything and I'll check the chat as well briefly so no questions I don't think so that's good and right so yeah I'll, I'll dive straight in then in that case so um yeah the background here is actually quite a simple question where do we need to build new uh, active travel infrastructure and one of the key things about active travel is that the trip distances are short and the vehicles are small. So you have to think on a slightly different geographic scale compared with trains, where you can think about hundreds of kilometers and draw straight lines on the map. 
and even roads, you're generally talking about bigger pieces of infrastructure. Whereas one of the key things with active travel, especially walking and wheelchair use and cycling is that you need dense networks. That's something that is well documented in the, in the literature. So how do you generate the, how do you build the network? Like in places in the majority of cities where you don't currently have dense walking and cycling networks, where do you intervene? And there's almost infinite options for where you intervene. So it's really hard, even if you know the city well, to prioritize. And the truth is certainly in terms of cycling is that investment has been focused on routes. So it's like, oh, well, we'll build a, lead, a, a route from Leeds to Bradford. That's actually happened. That was 30 million pounds worth of investment um, rather than thinking, what's the network that we need to build? And when you have a network plan, even when you build individual routes, which constitute the network, you're thinking it on the network level of how is this route contributing to the whole network? Where are the gaps in the network? So we need that network level approach. And we also need dense networks. So that's where the jittering comes in. Um, so yeah, I, and I could say more about this particular map, which happens to be of the Republic of Ireland and Dublin, which illustrates like another use, but the focus of this seminar is the methods in general and how they've been used uh, by Rosa and team, and I'm part of that team um, in, in Lisbon. So um, I'm just briefly going to say that this is based on open source software. So um, myself and others in ITS Leeds and increasingly in other academic research organisations are creating packages and tools to encapsulate these methods so that we develop the methods and we use it on for our work but we also distribute the the tools that allow other people um to to use the the methods in other places um so yeah reproducibility is a key part of this and also accessibility so other people can take this modify it and use it in their own situation and in a way this seminar is a story about reproducibility because uh, some of the ideas that were um, used in the propensity disciple tool have now been used in a different way um, for the particular needs um, in Lisbon. And OSGO there is one of the organisations that is really pushing um, open source software for geospatial software. Um, and they're just um, an organisation that massively supports some of the some of the tools that we're using. In terms of modeling framework, so um, in terms of principles, what we want is tools and methods that are modular. So you can break them into different pieces and reuse specific components on different projects. Obviously, we want the modeling framework to be future proof. So in five or 10 years time, we don't have to completely start again. We can build on the existing foundation. We want the approach to be scalable so we can use the same method for a small settlement um, that could scale nationally. And I believe that the approach that we're talking about here for Lisbon could scale to all of Portugal. And that's something that um, hopefully will be in the pipeline. And you can also represent the outputs using different uh, visualization techniques, um, which can be vector. So uh, we can use vector tiles or we can have some kind of raster map. So we want it to be as flexible as possible. Um, vital to the modeling framework it, that's represented in this image with A, B, C, D um, is, the, is the focus on origin destination data. So this is the data foundation of the approach. And rather than just having level um, data about each zone in your area, you have some data about the zone and how many people travel from um, each zone to every other zone. And that's like typical, that's pro possibly the, probably the most common form of transport data in the world. It's been used in, since the 1960s and you can get that data from Household Travel Survey. Uh, we get the data in the UK from the UK census. Obviously that's out of date. And you can also simulate origin destination data and it provides a very nice way of 
representing the travel behavior in a large area in a relatively small amount of data. And the framework that has been used and is well established, and this is coming from the Propensity to Cycle Tool project, is you take each of those OD pairs, you calculate a route for each one. So B has contains the same information as A, but instead of traveling in straight lines, they're traveling on the road network. Uh, C is what happens when you, instead of having multiple lines um, packed up on top of each other, you add together the total flow on each segment. So that's a route network representation. And then D is the same as C, but it's um, just a different way of visualizing it. So um, D is a raster visualization uh, that Malcolm, who's also in the audience, um, was um, heavily involved in, in developing that functionality. So jittering is based on this framework. And, it, and essentially, it's a way of, as so many, I guess, methodological um, developments, it's, it's um, designed to overcome some of the limitations of what we have at the moment. So um, yeah, and the best way to explain it is visually. So I'm not going to spend ages doing a Q&A, but what's, if you're looking at origin destination data, this is a minimal example of just three OD pairs um, going between um, some four different zones. This happens to be Edinburgh, but it could be anywhere in the world. And I'm just going to open it up to um, everyone in the audience. What, what, are, what are some of the limitations with this approach? And going back to the, 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 the need for active travel to have dense networks. When you're spatially aggregating your um, locations, which means that you haven't got enough uh, spatial definition yeah. to actually decide any kind of primary level of infrastructure. Exactly. So yeah, that, that's exactly right. So Kieran said that the it's the spatial resolution is low. You you are, the the benefit of OD data is also one of its biggest downfalls is that you're doing aggregation. So that simultaneously allows you to represent a huge amount of movement in a small amount of data. But the disadvantage is that you're simplifying reality. Instead of saying, um, like we've got an example here, which is the, the first column, 443 um, trips are represented in a single line. That is a real simplification. It has benefits for modeling, but it means that we are nowhere near the reality that people in each of these houses in the morning are getting out and they're, and they're traveling from a particular destination. So that's the one that I was looking for. And that's the one that we are tackling with this jittering problem. So jittering is actually quite simple. And it means that we can move quite quickly on to how we're using it rather than what the technique actually does. It's simply, I mean, it, it's a um, two-stage process. So jittering itself just means randomizing the start and end locations. And because each um, centroid is used multiple times, so a single zone origin could have a hundred different destinations. And it doesn't make sense for every single one of those OD pairs to start in the same place. So the first stage is just to randomize the start point. Um, I should emphasize that you can do that randomization using a range of techniques and the, the general solution that we've come up with is to use subpoints. So you can use any subpoints on the network, but in this example C, we've forced the um, randomized locations to start and end on the road network, which is logical. You could also use, um, if you're looking at travel to school, uh, we have done this, we could force the endpoints to be at schools. You could also force the start points to start at res residential locations. But that gives you total flexibility. Like you can define the subpoints, and it's also moving the emphasis of the kind of modeling away from that specific algorithm onto the researcher. You have to come with your own subpoints, and that's not our problem in the jittering process. So it's it's flexible. And then the final stage, which is represented in D, is instead of representing each OD pair 
OD pair as a single line, you break the line up into pieces. And again, that, that's the disaggregation and gives you the spatial definition. And that raises the question, how do you do that? And in jittering, the way that we do this is by setting a threshold, which is the maximum number of trips on any OD pair before you split. So you could set that um, bar quite low. So you could say um, any, any trip, any OD pair that has five or more trips needs to get split up until the, the value of each one is less than five. Or what we've done most recently is set that bar quite high to 100, which means that you get fewer lines. And that's, again, something that the user has to decide. We're not going to decide that for you. So it's quite a flexible and generalizable method. And I've got a few images that show what this looks like on this same example for Edinburgh. And you can see that um, you can randomize the start and end points. And rather than just having these repeated lines and these very clear start and end centroids, you end up with what looks more like a haystack. And that is actually more reflective of reality. Um, and then you can move on again and then snap that to the network. So B and C is, are essentially the same, but the start and end points are on the road network. And then D, it's much more dense because you're allowing the start and end points uh, to, to start and end anywhere. And the big desire lines are getting broken up into multiple pairs. And we've demonstrated that you get better road network results when you do that process. So um, we've got a um, JISRUC conference paper on this topic, and we found that um, when you do this, you get slightly better R squared. Like this, in a way, was toy data. We were not trying to, we weren't even using the full um, OD data because like, we just wanted to do a proof of concept. Um, so the, the, the paper that we're presenting today does this on a much bigger study um, based on some counterpoints that Rosa has actually been involved in generating this primary data. And I'm going to hand over to Rosa now to talk about how this has been used in um, Lisbon. Yeah, so the next step for tutoring approach is kind of a validation uh, that was lacked. Uh, and uh, we know that for uh, car travel, you only have a few options to go between B, A and B, but for pedestrian and cycling, you have multiple options. Uh, so what we did was to uh, take the, the cycling um, counts data that we had in Lisbon that we do every year since 2017 for uh, about 70 locations. And the, a big thing of this, uh, these counters that are manual counts, not automatic counters, is that they are located both in uh, the existing cycling infrastructure and uh, where they are, there is no cycling infrastructure. So uh, there's kind of a high probability uh, that uh, cyclists will go through, through the streets where there's no cycling infrastructure and not only go in the the cycling highways, you know, the, the cycling roads. So uh, we took these, these uh, different locations in Lisbon. As you can see, a lot of them are not in the cycling infrastructure. Uh, and we, we made the process of um, jittering with a, with a segregation of, I think it was 200, uh, no, 500 trips per, per OD. Um, and uh, made the, the routing in cycle streets um, uh, routing and uh, with the R5R uh, uh, routing, which uh, has different approaches uh, of routing and also different options of uh, quietness and the level of uh, traffic stress. So cycle streets uh, considers a uh, quietness level. Um, and the R5R, you can choose between four different uh, levels of traffic stress. So we, we run this, this, um, this routing for um, several combinations of options between uh, these uh, two uh, route, routing um, uh, engines, but also with the uh, Google Maps and the uh, other uh, routing engines. And um, and the, what we realized 
was uh, uh, when comparing also the disaggregation level and the ungetered uh, options also. Um, we made a correlation between the, the trips that were passing in each uh, data um, uh, collecting point uh, and the trips that the routing engine was uh, sending uh, through that uh, data collecting point. And uh, what we noticed it was that um, in this case, the, the 500 uh, disaggregation level uh, had a better uh, fit uh, in, a, in a, a cycling streets, but also the uh, level of traffic stress level two. Uh, we also tried with other uh, smaller disaggregation levels, so with more OD pairs, but it didn't improve uh, much the quality of data. So uh, that was uh, a validation process that we did with uh, this one um, data. Uh, but we can we can have other uh, other um, tests and other uh, approaches to do with other uh, cities and uh, where at least where there's uh, data available uh, to do that. So just to to talk about uh, the this project, Biclar project which is uh, based in a propensity to cycle tool. This is a project founded by the Lisbon Metro Region Department for Transport, uh, where about 3 million people live. But uh, the cycling levels are very, very low. So only about 25,000 trips every day are made by a bicycle, which is uh, very, very low. So the targets, the government targets are uh, to increase to 4% of uh, trips to be in cycling uh, by 2025 and 10% of all trips uh, by 2020, uh, 2030 um, also be uh, in uh, by cycle. Uh, and all these trips should uh, uh, move from car trips. So it's huge. Uh, it's passing from uh, 25,000 trips every day to uh, more than 2 million trips every day made by bicycle, which is kind of a huge uh, and very ambitious uh, target. But well, it's, uh, it's what they, they said and it's what we are trying to, to simulate um, and um, prepare this tool for a better decision on where to put the, these cycling infrastructures and uh, recommend to, I mean, provide um, evidence to for the decisions to to make the, those decide, uh, yeah, to decide, decide where to implement those uh, cycling infrastructure. Um, so all the the package is uh, based in R, um, and we have already set up a a, a small uh, landing page. Uh, this is the existing, so this is the Lisbon metro region with Lisbon city and there are other 18 cities, so it's 18 municipalities in one uh, whole um, region. And this is the existing cycling network, which has up about 300 kilometers, which is nothing. Uh, and this is one of the, the first results of uh, BICLAR. So this is the, um, the potential um, cycling network uh, with uh, just the top 30% uh, of, um, of routes that have more, um, more potential to bring uh, people from car to, to cycling. So it would be a, a huge improvement and it's something that municipalities uh, are really lacking because they have no idea how to start this, how to, where to, to invest. And this project has been uh, a success with that. We also uh, did training with them to to edit it, edit the open um, open street map, which was something that they didn't know how. Uh, we also provide training of uh, how to use the the heat for cycling tool, which is a um, economic and health assessment tool for uh, cycling and pedestrian projects. So they can better communicate with the audience that, oh, if we make this cycling infrastructure, there'll be uh, very good outcomes in the future. So this is uh, basically what we in the University of Lisbon are trying to do with, uh, with the Department of Transportation. 
Uh, yeah, this is um, the, the targets. So we are here in the baseline, the, the blue line, and um, we, we took the, the household uh, travel survey, which is our um, core data for this project, and um, uh, could relate the, the distance of the, the cycling trips and the, the levels of cycling. Uh, so if we if we if we project for the the four percent trips, there will be a huge increase in the uh, in the cycling trips per day. And if we project for ten percent, well, it's even higher. And the the most of the trips are between the two and five or seven uh, kilometers, which is also um, evidence related. I mean, it's uh, it's uh, related with the with the literature. Um, Robin, do you want to jump to the next steps? Um, well, first one is hackathon. So yeah, sure. So yeah, I mean, this this project has um, many aspects, but the like. The one that Rosa is talking about shows that we've got a job to get done, which is to provide route networks that are good for the government, for the regional government in uh, Lisbon. So that's kind of our, our focus of this collaboration. But we also want, we know that these problems are happening in many cities. So can we generalize it? And um, there's a few, I find quite interesting technical um, challenges that, that we're hitting. And so the way that we uh, are trying to address this is we're going to be working on it anyway, but we also want to open it up to make it a kind of learning experience and collaboration um, experience. So we're doing a hackathon today at 3 p.m. and you're invited. It's going to happen in person um, in this room. And given that it seems that the team's link is working, we'll also have a, an online element as well for anyone who wants to join um, online. And the focus of that is going to be to overcome one of the issues with using one of the routing engines, which is R5, which does give you an estimate of level of traffic stress, but it doesn't give you that estimate right down to the route segment level. So it's quite specific and we've got a nice um, starting point from that. I'm not going to talk through all of the other ideas for next steps because um, we can kind of touch on those if they're of interest in the questions. Um, but this is an ongoing uh, kind of area of research. And one thing that is increasingly important for me is um, walking. So I've been doing most of my research on cycling, but in fact, so, uh, walking is a more important mode in terms of number of people who participate in it. And it's, I think, the foundation on which sustainable active transport systems build. So that's something that I want to do, particularly as I've got a role in Active Travel England and a remit to develop tools for walking, wheeling and cycling, not just cycling. So that's one kind of policy area that I want to take in. Um, and unless you've got any other things to say, I think we can uh, just open it up to, to questions. And I see that we, we did schedule this from 11 till half 11, so bang on time. <laughs> We got through a load of content there, so thanks a lot for listening. And, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I can add just something. <laughs> um, so the, these um, bilateral research funds uh, between Portugal and um, British universities, uh, they open their applications every year. So if you are interested in some, some kind of collaboration with our U-Shift lab, feel free to reach us. Uh, they just provide you money for for these uh, travel expenses, but it's a good thing. Uh, yeah. I mean, this, this is what uh, what boosts our collaboration, and uh, it's it's a good thing to reply. Yeah. So, any questions? I'm going to stop the recording as well, but um, we will open this up to questions and anyone who is thinking of using these techniques, like. We think we've been talking about this and 